Hello buddy, it's Wyvern here with another Total War Warhammer 2 tier list. Now this time around, we are going to be discussing Lores of Magic. And some of you may be wondering, why the heck are we doing that again? After all, I relatively recently made a video covering the different Lores of Magic in the game, and nothing has really changed since then. However, the reason for that is as follows. When I made that video, it was oriented to multiplayer. This channel, as most of you know is very much a Total War Warhammer 2 multiplayer oriented channel. Um, most of my content is geared towards that. And unfortunately I didn't make that clear enough. So a lot of new viewers were confused about that in the previous video. I did try to rectify it a bit now with a title change on the video, but uh, that, that was definitely my mistake. But I realized how much interest there is and how many people are curious about how lords stack up in the campaign and how you can make good use of them and how valuable each different lore can be. And so I decided, you know what, let's go back, let's revisit the topic. So this time, instead of looking at it from the lens of multiplayer, we are going to be looking at Lords of Magic from the campaign perspective. Understand that everything here is very subjective. This is very much my opinion on things, and you're free to disagree. Uh, if you think my thoughts and opinions here are ridiculous, you're free to say so. If you have your own uh, insights or you agree or you've got other tidbits you'd like to add, certainly don't hesitate to share them down in the comments below. Uh, but I will try to keep things relatively brief, running down the benefits and downsides of each lore, and uh, then tearing them on the tier list where I believe they belong. So without further ado, let us, let us dive right in and kick things off with the same lore that began in the last video, and that is the lore of Itza. Now, some of you may be surprised because Lore of Itza is insanely powerful at what it does, Because, but I will be ranking it at B tier. And that is due to a few factors. First and foremost, this lore lacks versatility. Yes, it is incredibly, incredibly powerful at mob clear. It will annihilate cavalry, it will annihilate infantry very, very easily. There's no debating that. I, I think everybody knows that. However, that is all it does. Uh, it doesn't have any additional benefits, it doesn't have any additional perks. Uh, if you're fighting on a wider frontage, if you aren't necessarily super cheesing the AI, it can be a little difficult to get the max value out of the uh, the bombardment spells that this lore is composed of. You've simply got three tiers of Itza. You also don't have a multitude of spells you can spam out continuously, because oftentimes you just want to cast one type of Itza. You don't necessarily want to waste your Winds of Magic on some of the cheaper variants, because they might not be ideal for a situation at hand. And you're kind of stuck you're waiting on a cooldown so you often want to bring this with a secondary lore this lore is obviously limited to lord croak which means you can only have one of it which in campaign where if you're playing on lower difficulties you can have a lot of armies and even on higher difficulties you'll often have a good number of armies as lizard men um easily can have a, a by a relatively early stage in a campaign you can easily have half a dozen armies or so and only one of them can have croak so that is certainly a limiting factor and the lore does basically nothing to single entities, to monsters, infantry, to units like that. And that's not necessarily the most important thing in campaign, where AI is kind of stupid, and it also doesn't necessarily churn out that many monsters, usually. But it is still a limiting factor, and it means that in certain situations, especially if you end up getting a bit unlucky or running into um, an enemy army of composed of necrofexes or something, lore of Eats is going to do nothing for you. So... Just my two cents there, it is why I'm going to rate it as a high B tier, as in the previous tier list. If it's towards the left side of the, everything here, it is going to be a better lore than the stuff towards the right in that tier. Uh, I certainly do think it is insanely powerful at what it does, but the limitations on how many, uh, how much of this lore you can get, you can have only one caster, and the fact that it is a very uh, niche lore does limit it a bit, even in a campaign. And so for that, it is going to net itself a B tier. Now, next up, we do have the Skaven lore of stealth, and this was the recently added lore for Skaven, and unfortunately, I don't find this lore super appealing in campaign. Um, it's relatively easy to get the caster for this. It's not, it's not hard to get access to the lore of magic. It's not a bad lore by any stretch of the imagination, but ultimately, the other lores of magic you have at Skaven are, in my opinion, better. Uh, Lore of Stealth, you've got a Stealth spell. These are, in my opinion, basically worthless against AI. You don't need to kite and play sneaky games with AI. AI is dumb, dumb as a brick. You usually want to deal with them in a more blunt and direct manner, in my experience, even on higher difficulties. You might be cheesing a bit, but Stealth doesn't really help with that cheese. Uh, the buffs and debuffs, the Brittle Bones, and I believe it's Armor of Darkness. I forget, there's so many shadows and armor and darknesses and um, all that in this lore that 
It gets a little confusing, but I believe it is the Armor of Darkness. It does grant some significant AoE buffs. You can get plus 60 armor and some missile resistant AoE, or minus uh, 40 melee defense and some negative to armor with the Brittle Bone, which is very, very nice. So those are two good AoE debuffs. But as Skaven, you're usually more focused on the gunnery side of things, or if you're playing as Clan Eshin, you're focused more on the missile side of things, so that's not necessarily the foot missile side of things. So you're not too concerned about that, in my experience. It can be a good support lore for a rushy melee strat uh and certainly is not bad for that but ultimately those are the two main selling points the, and they don't necessarily synergize too well with the scaven, main, main scaven manner of play the passive on the lore is solid uh warp stars are a decent single target damage spells certainly not amazing but they can chip away enemy lords and heroes especially early on and then the two vortex spells in this lore are all right. Uh, they're not really world beaters. They don't. They're more, much more oriented at disruption. Uh, I've personally not found them as useful as the damaging spells in the other two Skaven lords of magic. And for that reason, this lore is going to net a C tier. Uh, I think maybe if it wasn't competing with other Skaven lords, it might get bumped to like a low B. But low B or high C is really where this lore belongs, in my opinion. Continuing with unique lores of magic, we are going to touch on lore of deeps. Uh, I think this lore gets bumped up to a B tier. This is actually the sole reason we had a D tier in the previous tier list, but I think deeps gets a B tier in campaign. Uh, the reason for that is, well, the AoE spells are actually decent on this lore against AI. Uh, they're certainly not amazing tier AoE spells, but they are passable. Um, so the passive on this lore is terrible. Kiss of the Deep is garbage. There's no redeeming it. Uh, it does so little damage that it's irrelevant. So that's just right there's not a great uh, passive. That's one downside for this lore. The Tide Call is fairly weak and spell and the disruption on it is not amazing. Uh, compared to something like Wind Blast, it's basically a joke. Spiteful Shot is kind of wasted against the AI because usually you don't engage in counter battery games. And even if you do, you usually have Chevron up Carronades, which offsets their innately bad accuracy. So those two spells are not particularly great there. Uh, but the remaining spells in the lore are, in my opinion, rather solid. Crab Summon can be used to stiffen up a front line. Now, granted, in campaign, you are often fighting with maxed out stacks, so you don't have the room to get additional summons. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if this was rectified. I'm not a big summon player in campaign. I'm not entirely sure if this was rectified now, because I know the changes were made for multiplayer, but uh, this might have been rectified in the last patch. Don't quote me on that. But uh, you might now be able to get the extra summons. But regardless, getting a crab summon, especially if some of your zombies have crumbled away, especially in early game when you don't care about throwing units away into the meat grinder, it can be a useful little perk to have. And if you're playing with smaller stack sizes with 20 stacks or something, it is a very valuable asset. The debuff that you can get from the Fog of the Damned is very, very good for protecting your zombies, helping your frontline hold longer, or otherwise breaking enemies with fear and terror. And then Vanguard's Revenge, as well as the Kraken's Pool, are both very good AoE damaging spells and can really help to shout the hurt to blob the AI that decides to clump up on you. Uh, they're not as good as some of the other wind spells or vortex spells, nowhere near it really, but they are still very respectable. And a good Vanguard's Revenge can net you some significant value. Uh, and so for that, Lore of Deeps is going to net itself a B tier, but once again, it is still competing with Lore of Vampires, and unfortunately I don't think it's really that good in comparison because lore of vampires is insane next up we do have the lore of the wild and this is the unique lore for the beastmen and this one is going to get itself a spot right here in between deeps and eights up for now and the reason for that is because well it's a solid lore it has some very good overall magic uh, the passive is solid it gives you a vigor boost and charge bonus boost unfortunately it's not that great in campaign, where with Beastmen, you're often playing these very shock-heavy Minotaur or Bestigore spam builds, and in those situations, the battles tend to be over very quickly, and you do not really care for the Vigor boost. It's not longer, grindier games, which is what the uh, passive on Lord Wilds really is all about. But still not bad. Uh, it's still a, a decent, if not amazing, passive. You do then have Vile Tide as well as Bray Scream. Both of these are very cheap and spammable spells. They can be used to punish a blobbed up AI, especially some of the lower end squishier units that you might fight early game, like goblins, like where it's invaluable now, especially with the watch changes to clear out goblins uh, with Malagor or something. It's really useful. You do have, um, it lets you trigger your vigor improving passive fairly often. Uh, the Bray Scream can be used to clear out these cha masses of cheap chaff, whether it's zombies or skeletons or uh, skinks, whatever it may be. Very useful spells for that. Then we do have the more damaging spells. We've got Devolve as well as Traitorkin. These are both large AoE damaging direct damage spells. Both come with unique debuff. Traitorkin debuffs enemy speed. Devolve debuffs enemy leadership. That makes it a very nice synergy if you're doing a uh, Nurgle stench. Uh, 
build where you're just trying to nuke enemy leadership without ever having to fight them, then getting that extra little boost can be nifty for sure. Uh, with Devolve, it's certainly a solid spell there. The damage output it does is pretty good. However, AI doesn't tend to dodge, so in campaign you can actually get much more value out of clumped up AI from vortexes and wind spells, bombardments, that sort of thing. The biggest selling point of direct damage in multiplayer is the fact that human players are much better than AI, generally. Uh, so they will dodge. They will try to break apart their formations and escape uh, and avoid your damage. AI is too stupid for that. So while Devolve does very good damage, you can often get much more value out of a Vortex like Purple Son of Zerus or something like that. Still a very respectable spell. You do have the Saigor Summon. Not a huge fan of that in campaign. Um, it, it doesn't last long enough to throw a lot of boulders. I usually don't play that playstyle anyway with Beastmen. And if you're just trying to shock and awe, you're better off hitting your opponent with Devolve, using Mantle of Gorok, uh, Traderkin, whatever, to burn down their HP faster rather than trying to get a Saigor in there. Uh, you'd, get, you'd need Terror somewhere, but you could probably run a... You could probably get a uh, Mask of E or something to get to get Terror, or or have another Shaman with Death or something to get uh, the Terror Bomb going. In my opinion, you just don't really need the uh, Saigor Summon. And then you do have the Mantle of Gorok, which is a nice single target buff, but in campaign, single target spells are not particularly great, and um, that is going to be a trend in this video. If it affects single targets, it's not going to be that good. In, in campaign, you oftentimes need to deal uh, affect a significant portion of your front line or the enemy front line. You need to deal with lots of units in those big 20 on 20 battles, 40 on 40 battles. Buffing up one unit is not that big of an impact. Uh, and while Mantle of Gorok can help you get those sneaky snipes on enemy lord or important unit very, very quickly, it's, much, it's just much less valuable in campaign than it is in multi. And for that reason, this lord does net itself a sort of decent B tier. Going on further and really focusing on the unique lores here, we are going to go to lore vampires, and this one is an easy S tier. Like, I could not imagine putting it anywhere else. Uh, the only spell in this that I feel you will never use really is the, um, is the uh, Curse of Years, because that's a good spell, but it's just outshone by all the other spells on this lore so much. Uh, but the rest of the sp the rest of the spells in this lore are just amazing. The passive is good; it heals all your troops map wide. You've got Invocation of the Heck, which is an insanely good heal that also resurrects models, making it good against all targets rather than Invocation of or um, Life Earth Blood or um, the or Life Bloom or the the healing abilities elsewhere, which only heal un existing models. They don't resurrect dead ones. Makes it less valuable on multi entity. Our, uh, units. Uh, you've got Raise Dead, which can be great for setting up, uh, for blocking off enemies trying to reach your gun line. If you're playing as the Coast, it can be great for disrupting enemy back lines. If you're playing as the Vampire Counts, you can use it offensively, defensively. Uh, you can use it as a bit of a net or a, a speed bump. There's just so many uses for the lore there, for the summon there. Invocation or um, Van Hell's Dance Macabre is amazing as a cheap AoE buff. Really helps offset the the generally inferior combat stats of Vampire Count units. The Gaze of Nagash is often maligned as kind of a weak uh, weak magic missile spell, but it's actually excellent at sniping out enemy lords and heroes that are squishy ones. So if you want to snipe out an enemy caster or some of those annoying Skaven casters that just spam warp lightning on you, you can hit him like twice with a Gaze of Nagash and he's probably dead. Uh, it's an insanely powerful spell against un lightly armored casters. Um, so two overcast Gaze of Nagash can oftentimes delete a squishy hero. So keep that in mind. It's a, it's a strong spell for Lord Sniping if you're into that and you don't want to engage in melee for whatever reason. And uh, then you do have the Wind of Death, which is probably the big head honcho spell for this lore when it comes to campaign. You can get AI to line up on your front line really easily. AI is dumb as a break, so they tend to fall into that. Overcast the Wind of Death, and you can delete thousands of units very, very quickly. Uh, and with all the Winds of Magic you get in campaign, it's just such a strong spell. So easy S tier for vampire, uh, Lord Vampires here. Moving on to the other unique undead lore here, the Lord of Nagkara. This one is not quite as impressive as the Lord of Vampires, though still, in my eyes, a respectable lore. The passive heals is basically the same passive as the Lord of Vampires. This lore is unique to the Tomb Kings, of course. Uh, unfortunately, it has a lot of single target spells, and that is one of the things that really holds it back, is that you do not have a lot of AoEs, and as I mentioned before, you want those in campaign, because you need to impact more units at once. The uh, Joffs Incantation of Curse Blaze, excellent buff, can really help trigger your passive to heal your whole army, which is nice, but it only affects one unit, which is... It can be helpful if you're in a Lord Sniping situation, or you need one key unit to do a lot, but it's not as useful as a big AoE could be. Um, the... 
An arrow's incantation of protection. It can help preserve a key unit in a critical moment, especially a lord or a big construct, especially early game when you're oftentimes limited to just one or two constructs or you don't have a lot of these elite units. It can be great, but uh, ultimately by late game, you want something that's buffing all your troops, not just impacting the one. Uh, same thing with the, I believe it's Asaph's... Uh, it's the missile buff, and I forget. I, they're all named after gods, and I forget what its name is. But regardless, there is a missile buff. But once again, it's only single target. So yes, you can buff your Bone Giant, or your Shopti, or your Memeing Skull Catapults. Whatever the case may be, you can make them hit a lot harder and shoot a lot faster. But is it worth it? Probably not. Uh, you're probably better off trying to get use out of the AoEs in this lore. Unfortunately, there are some decent ones here. However, the next spell we're actually going to discuss, Eusterian's Incantation of Vengeance, is actually also a single target spell. It's basically a souped up Melkos Miasma, slows your opponent, does some damage. Uh, it's not a bad spell at all, but it only affects one target, which is a hindrance. Uh, it is not ideal and makes it a... Uh, and you, when you really want a lot of AoE damage... It, it holds the lore back. Um, all these spells are solid, though. I, sh I should mention, all these single target spells are solid, so if you scatter, stagger them out throughout your army, you can get one unit's survivability up, have one unit shooting better, have one unit, uh, be enemy unit getting slowed and focused. It can work out, but it's just not as good as having one big nuke. Sackmet's Incantation of Skullstorm, great for dealing with mobs. It is a very cheap and spammable Vortex spell. Not as good as... Some of the other Vortex spells in the game, not very good against armor, obviously useless against single entities and monsters, and even cavalry, but it is a Vortex spell, it can help clean out chaff, which is often a problem for Tomb Kings. Uh, finally, we do have Yusuf's Incantation of Desiccation, which is amazing, It deep, it's basically an AoE Enfeebling Foe, awesome if you're going for a melee monster rush, or construct rush. Uh, so that is just an awesome spell, and really what pushed for me pushes this lore up towards a higher B tier. Because uh, otherwise, there's not as much. I would pro If it wasn't for Usef's Incantation Desiccation, this guy would probably be like a low B. Probably beneath de deeps for sure. Pushing onward with the unique Lords of Magic, we do have the remaining Skaven Lords of Magic, and the first is the Lore of Ruin. Now this one is going to net an A tier, and the exclusive reason for this, essentially, is, warp is the Warp Lightning. Uh, Warp Lightning is a very, very spammable spell. It lets you trigger your passive, which debuffs enemy leadership and melee attack very often. Uh, you can annihilate blobs of infantry with it relatively quickly. You can blob, annihilate cav, uh, and it's just a very, very solid AoE damage spell. And it works on sieges, it works defensively, it works offensively. Um, anywhere your opponent clumps, you can bombard them. Uh, the other spells in this lore are okay. Flensing Ruin is a decent AoE damage spell if you're looking for something to hit a larger area. It is not amazing. It did replace Skitter Leap, which is now in Lore of Stealth um, in the past DLC patch uh, with the uh, implementation of Eshin and uh, Malice. But it's not the most amazing damage spell. Cracks Call as well as uh, the... Scorch are both decent damage spells, but they're not amazing once again. They're not going to win you any beauty contests or damage contests or whatever it may be. Uh, in general, you'll be wanting to spy more Blightning, but having a little bit of wind, wind spell there, action or breath spell action can be nifty in certain circumstances. Uh, the, the Death Frenzy, which is the AoE buff on it, is excellent for Skaven. It buffs your melee attack, so it can make melee blobs a bit better. It also gives you immunity to psychology, which can protect your troops from routing, which can be an issue against AI sometimes, especially on higher difficulties where your troops don't have the greatest leadership. Uh, though certainly not the greatest selling point on this lore at all. And then we do have the... Um, Warpstorm, which is in multiplayer the big selling point on this lore, but in campaign I don't think it's that useful. You can certainly snare a large chunk of enemy flyers with it and gun them all down, uh, but AI is kind of bad with using its flyers, so oftentimes you can just shoot them to death before they even get that close uh, to need the Warpstorm, and uh, it's a bit of it's a very niche spell, but it is a strong spell in that niche. And so Lore of Ruin is going to get a low A tier, uh, but is really propped up by Warp Lightning. Without it, it's probably actually as low as a low B tier. But a uh, very solid lore, in my opinion. It just has a decent selection of decent spells, and then Warp Lightning, which is awesome. Uh, the other Skaven lore, of course, is Lore of Plague. Now, this one is going to get a upper A tier, and the reason for that is because it has a really good plethora of a it has a really good plethora and AOE of and variety of AOEs. Uh, you can apply poison to all your units with the uh, with uh, with uh, one spell in the year. Um, with, uh, 
The passive debuffs enemy vigor, so it makes them fight worse over time, which is really nice. Pestilent Breath uh, allows you to nuke blobs of enemy squishy troops, um, especially lower end chaff like skinks or skeletons or zombies or uh, other skaven, whatever you may be fighting, it's very useful there. Uh, the Wither is amazing for debuffing enemy armor. The uh, Uh, the it, do you have semi armor by 60 with overcast, which lets your plague monks perform much better. It can also help if you happen to be running Eshin slingers without playing Eshin, uh, whether gutter runners or night runners or builds like that. It can really help offset their lack of AP. Uh, as mentioned, pestilent the uh, pestilent. I forget what the name of the spell is that gives, gives po that poisons your weapons, uh, but is it is a solid solid ability uh, that is just to help. You snare and debuff enemies. So obviously, that's bugged at the moment, but should be fixed hopefully in the hot. Well, the beta is already out, and hopefully the hotfix drops soon. Um, and then you do have plague. Now, this is a lore, a spell that is not used a huge amount from what I, in multiplayer or campaign, from what I've seen. But it's actually not a bad damaging spell. It's a stationary vortex that expands over time. It's got a really cool animation of a plague monk flailing around, uh, and. It's actually a solid damaging ability. It can do quite a bit of hurt over time if your opponent blobs up, and AI does tend to blob up. Uh, finally, you do have your two summons. You've got your clan rat summon as well as your plague monk summon. Both are good to just snare enemies, bog them down, prevent them from getting into your backline, uh, or compromise their backline, and bait them into blobs where you can then warp bomb them or hit them with a just storm of magic damage or a long-range artillery fire, whatever the case may be. Uh, but those summons are very, very useful for the Lord of Plague. And so it's going to get itself a high A tier, despite not having any one sort of domineering spell in a campaign. I don't think any of the spells in this lore are just through the roof amazing, but as a whole, the lore is a very solid lore. Moving on, we do have the Greenskin lores, and the Little Wa is unfortunately not a very good one. And it's going to net itself a low C tier. Uh, this is the only one I'd consider for a D tier in campaign. Uh, it's just not a very good lore for campaign. It's in multiplayer, it's excellent, but campaign's not multiplayer. Uh, the passive on this lore is very weak because AI sucks at using magic, except for Skaven. So who cares about debuff sneaky steal and stealing their magic? Uh, Vindictive Glare is good for sniping large lords and characters, but that's often not a problem with AI. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's just not that good there. Um, and it's not great against foot characters, which is usually what you're fighting against with AI. Uh, the Sneaky Stabbin is an excellent single target buff, but it's only a single target buff. And as we discussed before, single target buffs are not amazing against a... Against a... Uh, Single target buffs are not amazing against AI or in multiplayer, or sorry, in single player, where you often need to buff larger stacks. HG Nuisance is a decent AoE debuff, but ultimately it is not an amazing debuff. It is something you can spam a decent amount. Uh, it can help keep your front line in the fight a bit, uh, but it's certainly not some game-breaking boost, uh, as some of the other spells in other lores can be. Uh, the... Night Shroud, which is of course the stealth spell, is basically useless. As I mentioned before, Skitter Leap for Skaven and Lord of Stealth is not very good. You don't need to stealth and avoid AI that way. AI is just dumb, so you don't really need Night Shroud. It doesn't really help very much. The Curse of the Bad Moon, which is the roving green, uh, green skin head and looks amazing. It's one of the most awesome looking spells in the game. Uh, is a vortex that debuffs enemy melee defense, armor, and I believe speed. Which makes it seem like it's pretty good. It doesn't affect friendlies anymore, I believe, after the last patch. And in theory, it should be decent. The problem is, it's not very spammable. And as a vortex, it often doesn't hit the units you want it to hit. It'll hit the one unit you targeted, then it robes off, and it you might not get a debuff on the stretch of line you wanted to debuff. Uh, it might just hit one enemy unit, and you just spent a bunch of wins of magic to get a debuff on a single target, which is okay, I guess. It's not as big of a buff as you'd want it to be, especially compared to Lord of Bigwa, which lets you stack some insane buffage on your boys. So, unfortunately, although potentially it has some decent value, <coughs> it's just not an amazing, amazing debuff there. Uh, and then we've got Gorkul Fix It, which is an amazing spell in multiplayer. It's a massive snare, 48% speed debuff in an AoE. In campaign, AI is dumb as a brick. You don't really need to snare them. You need to you don't really need to character control them. You're probably never going to get this spell, and I probably won't even spec into it. Uh, unless you have points spare. Uh, 
I just don't think it's useful at all against AI. Uh, so unfortunately, that really pushes this lore into C tier. There's a handful of decent spells in there, and better to have some magic than none, but uh, I, I think it's the weakest campaign lore, to be honest. Bigwa, uh, however, is the complete opposite. It's an insanely powerful campaign lore, and I would rate it as a very high A tier, one that is pushing towards an S tier, and I'm that's something I'm very much waffling on. Passive gets you more wins of magic, which is always good, uh, even though it's kind of a lackluster or uninspiring bonus. You've got two melee attack buffs, one single target, Fists of Gork, which does imbue you with magic your target unit with magic damage, can help them win key engagements. Does have the downside of being a single target spell, as we've discussed before. But it's a solid buff, nonetheless. Mork's, Gaze of Mork is an okay anti-single target magic missile ability. It's not amazing. Just like Vindictive Glare, I don't think you're going to get huge amounts of value. But you can try to snipe out enemy lords, especially early game with like Ward Sag. When you've got nothing better to do, I, it can be alright. But that's really not the selling point of this lore, and it's not why you're bringing it. The real selling point of this lore is the other spells we're about to discuss. Brain Bursta, amazing, cheap, spamble. AoE bombardment spell. It explodes, does very good damage, especially the low-end squishy troops, but can even do some damage against armored foes with an overcast. Uh, brain, uh, the he uh, headbutt can help disrupt enemy troops, help disrupt their formations, does a decent chunk of damage. The Here We Go is a AoE 40 melee attack buff. Can really soup up an entire stretch of your line. If you think about it, it's essentially 80 meters of your line that you can often buff up with this. Insanely strong buff. You can turn your monster, uh, monster and hero goon squad into an absolute powerhouse. It is, it is awesome. I, I love. Here we go. It's a very, very strong spell. And then, of course, the signature spell of this lore is Foot of Gork, which just deletes mobs left and right, no problem. You get the massive green foot coming down from the sky and annihilating your foes. And especially overcast, it will just eradicate cavalry, infantry, all that. Uh, the lore does lack a bit in the single target sniping department. It doesn't have any debuffs really to help keep your troops alive longer it's more about just killing really well uh, but i do think it's an excellent lore and it's one that hinges right on the edge of a and s tier and i it's one i i'm very tempted to push into s tier not entirely sure it's a very very good lore uh, the final unique lore we will touch on here that's exclusive is the lore of dark and that lore in my mind is kind of meh it's it's not a great campaign lore uh, i'm going to give it a low a but it's somewhere between low A and high B. Uh, passive on this is not amazing. It's minus 15 armor to everything map wide. Dark Elves, who this is exclusive to, of course, have armor piercing coming out their rear end. The, almost every unit on their roster has AP, except their cheapest, crappiest infantry. So you almost never get value on this, uh, except, I guess, if you're running Doomfire Warlocks and Sisters of Slaughter. That's really the only example where I could think of where this is useful in the late game. Uh, the... Chill Wind is an okay damaging wind spell, but it's not something that's going to take your breath away. Uh, Power of Darkness gets you a little more winds of magic, which is nice. Um, and the self damage doesn't matter as much when you've only got when you've got 20 or 40 stack to deal with, or you might have regening hydras in your army or something like that. Uh, so that's a cool ability that's very unique to this lore. Uh, where and especially with some points and uh, skill points invested in it, you can get good amounts of winds of magic with Power of Darkness uh, added on, which is kind of difficult to get value out of in multiplayer. Uh, oftentimes it actually won't even generate enough ones of magic to justify itself in late game. Besides that, you do have the Word of Pain, a single target debuff, which when overcast will debuff enemy melee defense as well as melee attack and accuracy. Normally it's just melee attack and accuracy, uh, but usually you want to use it for sniping against AI, and so you want that melee defense buff. So it's basically an overpriced enfeebling foe. Uh, unfortunately, that's not a huge selling point in my eyes. I'd rather just get an enfeebling foe. Uh, but it's an all right, all right spell. Doombolt, single target sniping spell, uh, homes in, can can damage a clump if you're dealing with like a clump of cav or clump of, of infantry, but uh, really Doombolt is something you want to use against single targets. It's not amazing for it. It's, it's an all right character sniping spell, but certainly not up there with like a final transmutation or fireball or something. Uh, you do also have Blade Wind, which is a nice vortex spell. Uh, it can really mess up infantry and even cavalry if they're, you get them blobbed up. And as we've discussed before, AOE likes to, or AI likes to blob, so AOEs work well. Same thing with Soul Stealer. It is a self heal as well as large direct damage spell. It can really mess up, especially cavalry, uh, though it will do some damage to single entities and monsters. Uh, not very good against infantry, but it also heals the casting character. So. A solid spell, 
amazing in, in multiplayer, not so amazing in campaign, but decent enough. And I think with that mix of decent AoEs in this lore, as well as a little potential to get some more wins and magic out of it, uh, I think it's a passable enough lore to get a low A, uh, maybe a high... On second thought, I think it does deserve a high B, is what I'll, where I'll put it. It's not a bad lore, but it's not, not an amazing sort of take your breath away lore. Now we are on to stuff that overlaps with multiple factions. I guess lore vampires overlaps with multiple factions. So that's not entirely fair of me, but oh well. You guys get what I mean. Uh, we'll go with lore, high magic. That's kind of exclusive. It's exclusive to lizards and high elves. And this is not a very good lore in campaign at all, in my opinion. Uh, it's not a bad lore, but it, it's just a bit lacking because its design is more about versatility and buffing single targets or dealing with single targets than it is about those big wampin AoEs. So the passive on this is amazing. 11% ward save for a little bit around on map wide, which you can spam with Apotheosis, Hand of Glory, and Soul Quench, your three cheap spammy spells. Sounds good. The problem is all those cheap spammy spells only affect a small AoE. Apotheosis is a, sing is a single target heal that doesn't heal for a huge amount. Uh, it can help keep some important targets in the fight early on in a game. Uh, like Mazda Mundi can heal up his Sarah Scarvet with it or his Temple Guard with it. It's nice for that, but it's not amazing. It's not hitting a big AoE like Invocation of the Hack, which hits four targets at once. Hand of Glory, nice single target buff that can either boost rate of fire or boost melee attack also triggering that ward save. The problem is that it, once again, only affects one unit. And oftentimes you want to be affecting a bigger AOE and buffing up multiple units. And so unfortunately it just doesn't hold up in that situation. Uh, though it is good for triggering your ward save. And in those early game battles where you often have small amounts of units, it can be a much bigger game changer. Uh, the Soul Quench is a decent single unit spell magic missile it, it's weird it can be used to snipe very squishy casters uh, i've had this demonstrated to me now quite a bit uh in, in uh, friendly multiplayer matches so it can be a decent single entity uh, sniping spell against squishy casters it can be a very good counter to infantry or even cavalry uh, if you get some square hits with it but uh, ultimately it's just the magic missile that only affects one unit and if they've got armor it does really doesn't shine that much uh, the Arcane on Forging is basically an overpriced Spirit Leech that resets enemy cooldowns. AI is terrible about using cooldowns, so it's pretty irrelevant there, in my opinion. Uh, not a very useful ability at all for campaign. Uh, Tempest is great at deleting enemy flyers. The problem is the AoE is not that big. And once again, you can usually gun down flyers before they reach you, or you're playing lizards or something and you want to kill them when they land anyway. So... Uh, just not that good of a spell in campaign. Uh, it can be used to snare a key target, gun them down as high elves, what, whatever. It definitely has uses, but it's very, very niche. You just do, And you don't even face flyers very often in campaign, uh, outside of quest battles, really. And finally, you do have the in, uh, Fiery Convocation, which is an excellent spell. It's a very powerful wind spell. Not quite up to snuff with a Wind of Death, but a very, very good damaging spell. And can dish out a lot of hurt to an enemy battle line. And that is the, what really keeps this lore... Of magic up in the B tier, I think. Uh, otherwise, it would be even C tier, just because so much of this lore is single target or niche. Uh, the other benefit, of course, is the passive. Those two things really do prop lore of high magic into a very respectable position, at a low B tier. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it, I think, over most other lores in campaign, unfortunately. Next up, going into the very generic lores here, we do have Lore of Shadows. Now, this is a lore I absolutely adore. I really do like the Lore of Shadows. Whether or not I would put it above or below Ruin, I'm not entirely sure. I, I really like Lord of Shadows, though. It is a jack-of-all-trades lore that's just generally very good. The passive sucks for campaign. It's a speed boost. You don't really need that. Uh, Melkos Miasma is a single target slow and damage spell. Not bad at all. Can be used to whittle down key targets. Can be used to snare an occasional skirmish cab, that sort of thing. But not the huge selling point there. Enfeebling Foe, single target debuff. Cheap, efficient can help you snipe out enemy lords and heroes and big monsters quickly in melee. Excellent spell. You do have uh, Wither, which is probably the weakest spell in this lore. Uh, Debo enemy armor by 30 and leadership by 8. Can be used in conjunction with non-AP units, which depending on faction you might have a lot of. With Wood Elves you might have Wild Riders, Ward Answers. Uh, Empire you might have Reichsguard, Knights of the Blazing Sun, uh, Archers, Huntsmen, 
uh, whatever the case may be, beastmen may be running a bunch of gores or, or messing around, and that sort of strategy. And you want to debuff enemy leadership and armor. And whatever the case may be, you can get good value out of shadows there. Oakum's Mind Razor, the opposite, a massive AoE buff, plus 50% weapon strength, which is currently bugged, but fixed in the hotfix, and uh, hopefully that comes soon. Otherwise, you can get the beta with that. But uh, Oakum's Mind Razor, insane AoE buff, plus 50% weapon strength, and imbues magic damage, can really turn damaging units into absolute murder monsters and mediocre damage units into very decent fighters. Uh, so it's an excellent spell. Drop that on a herd of minotaurs and you are blessed with a world stomping destructive torrent of force. It's insane. Uh, Oakland Riders are very good. And then you have the two AoE damage spells. You've got, of course, the Prumble Pendulum, which can delete a significant area. Sweeping through enemy troops and is the only wind spell that is blessed with no deviation from its path. Uh, so it can really be used to precision bomb enemy infantry lines. And then, of course, the Pit of Shades, which is a stationary vortex, very powerful on walls. Um, and if your AI opponent decides to blob, can punish them very nicely. And thus, it makes Shadows a very solid lore. In fact... I it's, it's very tough for me to decide where exactly it falls here. Once again, I don't think any of the spells in this lore are so amazing as to carry it hard, but it is kind of like Lore of Plague. I might even put it up above Ruins here, because Ruin is propped up by Warp Lightning. Uh, but I think Lore of Shadows just has so many good, versatile spells that it nets itself a respectable middle A. Next up, we do have the Lore of Metal, and this is a awesome lore and campaign, in my opinion. Uh, very much underrated by a lot of people, I think. On Gelt, it is just completely broke OP, but even for other factions, it is a very, very solid lore, and here, here's why. Um, the passive, not the most amazing thing ever, buffs melee uh, weapon strength. Not bad, not not great. It's okay. Plague of Rust debuffs a single target's armor, makes them easier to snipe with non-AP units. That's all right, it's a massive selling point in multiplayer, not so much in campaign, as we discussed, single target spells, not that good. But the rest of the spells in this lore are actually pretty solid. One, you've got Searing Doom. This is a dirt cheap AoE bombardment that can really mulch lightly armored enemy troops. Uh, in early game as Gelt, for example, you can just delete swarms of Empire State troops and Orc troops and Beastmen very, very easily by just spamming Searing Doom. Gana's Golden Hounds, a kind of lackluster vortex, especially in multiplayer, is very spammable once again. So you can just delete mobs of enemy troops by spamming Gehanna's Golden Hounds. You do also have the Glittering Robe, which grants a targeted unit plus 60 armor in an AoE when overcast. So it can be used to soup up a lightly armored or unarmored line very efficiently. Those high elf spears you have just went up from 40 to 100 armor. Your Illyrian Reavers that are fighting for their lives against some enemy cavalry, you just bump them up to 100 armor. And Empire State Troops up to 100 armor. Um, uh, Berserkers from Norska. Up to 75 armor from that measly 15 they started off with. Whatever the case may be, that plus 60 armor can be a massive game changer uh, when it hits large AoE of your front. Then you do have the Transmutation of Lead, probably the, one of the weaker spells in this lore. Uh, Debuff enemy melee attack and weapon strength, which is nice, but ultimately, if you're going to be spamming an expensive spell, you probably want to be using Final Transmutation, which is really the massive selling point of this lore. Deletes everything except infantry, essentially. You hit a large area, it will delete enemy lords, cavalry, monsters, anything trapped within is taking insane amounts of damage. If you're Gelt, you can spam this spell around the clock and just eradicate in almost entire armies if you get a good blob uh, with Final Transmutation. It is insanely strong. And really the strongest direct damage spell uh, you can get for campaign, in my opinion. Uh, and for that, those reasons, Lore of Metal does get itself a very solid upper A tier. Moving on, we do have the Lore of Light. Now, this lore is decent. It's not amazing, not bad. It's a stable, in my opinion, uh, A tier, once again. Uh, somewhere around Lore of Shadows. It's, it's got some good versatility. The passive isn't great. Buffs leadership, gives you immune psychology. You don't need that against AI, especially because this lore is for Tomb Kings, High Elves, and Empire, all of whom already have access to decent leadership or are literally unbreakable in the case of Tomb Kings. And the Lizards, who are almost unbreakable, so... Who gives a crap? <laughs> but same thing with Light of Battle, which is, I'm going to get out of the way. That's a terrible spell. It makes units unbreakable, uh, which, who gives a crap? <laughs> it's basically useless against AI. I'm sorry. The other spells in this lore, though, are decent. Shem's Burning Gaze, excellent single target killer. Um, 
when I say excellent, but it's decent. It's an okay single target killer. You can use it to snipe enemy lords and heroes, much like other magic missiles. Certainly not the most amazing example of its kind, certainly not the most amazing item for the job, but decent enough. Besides that, you do get the Faz Protection as well as the Baronus Time Warp, which are both AoE buffs. Baronus Time Warp hits a grand 55 meter radius with its overcast version, which is insane. You get plus 24 melee attack in a 55 meter radius. That's a 110 meter stretch of front line you can hit with Baronus Time Warp. It is insane what you can get. You hit a blob of your monsters as the Lizardmen or as as the uh, High Elves, and you get some insane value there. Uh, Foss Protection is the opposite. Oh, oops, there. Foss Protection is the opposite. It is the defensive equivalent. You get plus 24 melee defense, plus 30 armor. Uh, can help your Empire State Troops or High Elf Spears or whatever hold that much better against your foes. So both very, very solid AoE buffs can really stiffen up the line. Net of a Mintok, of course, the signature spell of this lore. Wonderful for netting down a key target or multiple key targets and eradicating them with long-range firepower. Very good for High Elf Sister of Avalon stacks. Very good for Empire Gunnery stacks. Uh, just amazing value there. And finally, we do, of course, have Banishment, which gives this lore some AoE damage output, allows you to delete large clumps of enemies, all in all, it's a very well-rounded lore. Much like Lore of Shadows, you basically have a tool for every job. The, really, these upper A-tier lores that are not super high are all essentially lores that can do a little bit of everything. They got buffs, they got debuffs, uh, in, or in, some, or in most cases. You've got a bit of buffage, you've got a bit of uh, debuffage, you've got damage output against different target types, uh, some defensive spells, that sort of thing. It's a ver just very versatile lores here. Next up, we do have the lore of life. This lore is, in my opinion, uh, a bit overrated. I'm going to put it at a mid A tier, and some of you guys might be a little surprised or off put by this, but the reason for that is because life is just not that good in campaign. Um, <laughs> if you run a Doom stack of single entities, it is amazing. Uh, you can run your Star Dragon or Dragon Doom stack or Phoenix Doom stack or Dinosaur Doom stack. Yes, in that situation, life is great because Earth Blood will heal those units a bunch. But with any other combination of units, the spells in this lore are kind of okay. Uh, Earthblood is a nice heal, but it's not necessarily as valuable as some of the massive AoE melee attack and defense buffs you can get with other lores. Uh, you do not have any equivalent to spammable vortex spells in this lore. Uh, the passive in this lore heals. You've got two damage spells. You've got Awakening of the Wood and Dwellers Below. Both are bombardments. Awakening of the Woods only really works against lightly armored low HP troops. Though he does an okay job there. And Dwellers Below is a decent AoE nuke, but uh, ultimately... It is not as spammable and not necessarily as precise or devastating as some of the wind spells uh, or as a, as a bombardment spell like Foot of Gork. It's not quite up there with those. It does give the lore some nice oomph, but uh, it's not quite up there. Regrowth only affects one target. When If you're running a big, even a big monster stack, you often want to heal multiple targets at once. A bit lackluster there. Flesh to Stone, single target armor buff. Single target buffs aren't that good. Uh, Shield of Thorns is nice, nice physical resist buff, synergizes super well with units like Grail Knights or Wild Riders or Dragon Princes who don't have AP damage, so they get a damage boost from it, plus they, or they don't have a lot of AP damage, so they get a good damage boost plus more physical resistance. Uh, it's a nice spell, for sure. Earthblood's a very good spell for those AoE heals, but really the lore doesn't have any massive game-shifting spells, in my opinion. Uh, and it really synergizes best with a mob of single-entity monsters. That's where the lore spikes up to probably an S-tier. If we were only talking about lores that work with single-entity monsters, this would probably be an easy S. But uh, for general usage, I think it's a lower A, for sure. Lore of Heavens is another lore that I think falls into this central A category. It's a very, very respectable lore of magic. Uh, I'm going to put it just below Plague, but I think it's a very respect. I think all these lores you could argue from like here to like here I, there, I think there's a lot of argument to be had what belongs where but uh lord of heavens passive is not very good it's very niche uh, it only affects flyers and it debuffs them a lot minus 24 speed minus or 24 percent speed minus 24 melee defense but that's only flyers which you don't see very often and that's not too important uh, harmonic Convergence, single target, melee attack and defense buff, essentially a magic free Fistal Gork. Decent spell. Not amazing just because it only affects one target, but still a very respectable spell. Uh, the Curse of the Midnight Wind is an AoE reduction to enemy armor and melee attack. It is a very solid 
Uh, defensive lo uh, defensive spell can really help a front line stick around, especially if you're playing something like Empire or uh, Bretonia, where your front line is not composed of the finest troops. That can really be a big boon. And then you've got a lot of damage spells. Uh, you've got two different bombardments, Comet of Cassandora as well as the um, Uranus Thunderbolt. Both are excellent relatively small AoE bombardments. Very good for fighting on walls because your other two damage spells don't work on walls. Uh, so it gives you a little bit of versatility here. It can be used to blob bombard enemy blobs. Very, very solid. Uh, but I don't think they're quite up to snuff with the other two damage spells unless you have to fight on walls because Chain Lightning is amazing. It just cleaves through enemy mobs. If you blob your opponent on a land bridge or on one of the choke pointy maps, it will do insane work. Wind Blast, similar case. You get a nice Wind Blast on your opponent's rear. Uh... It can eradicate, especially cheaper infantry with an overcast wind blast. You can just annihilate units of Skaven slaves, uh, skinks, Empire State troops, all that, uh, high elf spears, that sort of thing. We'll just get destroyed by wind blast. It's a very, very solid spell. And the lore is just overall very, very flexible, very, very solid. And uh, that's why it nets itself an A. Really, the only downside is the uh, passive. Lore of Fire is going to get itself an S tier. And uh, I'm sure some people will not necessarily agree with that. That's okay. I think Lore of Fire is amazing just because it's such a good damage lore. Uh, and damage spells are super good in campaign. You've got Fireball, which is a great single target sniping spell. Your passive is Kindle Flame, which synergizes with every single spell in this lore, except for Cascading Fire Cloak. Every single spell you cast gets an extra 22% damage because you have Kindle Flame, which goes off every time you cast. Uh, so that's awesome. You get Fireball which is good for single target sniping. You get Cascading Fire Cloak, good for defending key targets. It's cheap, it's fairly spammable. If you're trying to synergize with something like Sister of, of Avalorn or Knights of the Lightning Sun, it can actually be good just to throw that out there just to trigger Kindle Flame and get that synergy damage. You've got the uh, Flaming Sword of Ruin, boosts damage output for both missiles as well as melee troops in an area, gives them magic and fire damage, which once again means they synergize with Kindle Flame now, which is an insanely powerful AoE buff, especially in campaign where you can hit a large area with it. Then you do have Flamestorm, arguably one of the worst vortexes in multiplayer because it roams like mad, but it will eradicate enemy infantry. You drop it on a blobbed up pocket of enemy troops, they are probably all going to die. It's it's terrifying how much damage it does. Flaming, uh, uh, Burning Head, of course, one of the signature spells in this lore. Great for deleting walls of enemy infantry. It does tend to deviate a lot. It's got, I believe, a 20 degree deviation rather than the usual 10 degree deviation. Um... So it can deviate more significantly than other uh, wind spells, but it is still a very, very powerful wind uh, ability. And against units like clan rats or skaven slaves or um, skeletons, all those usual chaff units, it will just eradicate them. Uh, then you've got piercing bolts of burning, which can actually be used to kill single entity targets. If you've managed to snare them or bog them down and they're standing in place, you can bombard them and kill them. Otherwise, excellent for dealing with enemy blobs. Uh, just does insane amounts of work there. And as a result, this lore just has damage output for every single target. Uh, you've got some decent buffs. It synergizes very well with units outside of the lore as well, with the Kindle Flame passive. Just a really nice lore, in my opinion. And the final, sp uh, the final spells we have here, or the final lores we have here, are Death as well as Beasts. Uh, these unfortunately are not that good i think death is going to get itself a low b tier some of you guys may be shocked by that you think death will be super high i don't think so spirit leech decent lord and cavalry sniping spell but it's only single target and as i've mentioned before not that great in campaign uh aspects of the dread knight and doom and darkness are both good aoe debuffs for sure or buffs in the case of dread knight debuffs in the case of Doom Darkness, but they're very niche and, and require some synergy. I think generally you're going to have some terror causing you in your army, so you don't really need Aspect of the Dread Knight. And the plus 8 leadership doesn't tend to matter in campaign. It's not very good at flanking and surrounding. Uh, if your troops are routing, you're probably screwed anyway. Uh, whereas Doom and Darkness is nice if you're going for a terror bomb build, but outside of Beastmen, not too many factions tend to do that in campaign. You can certainly do it uh, with stacking the leadership debuffing traits on your characters but uh and there's a few factions that can do it though nobody quite up to snuff with nurgle stench which is minus five rather than the usual minus four but leadership but uh ultimately that's a single gimmicky use and otherwise i don't think it's that valuable against ai uh which leaves leads us to fate of buna once again, single target damage spell. Yeah, you can mess up some elite infantry or cav with it, but one unit out of 20 is not 
the end all be all deciding factor. Uh, then you do have Soul Blight, which is a nice AoE armor debuff and weapon strength debuff. Decent debuff. Nothing sort of earth shaking or amazing though. Uh, it's just a decent spell. And then Purple Son of Zerus, which is a good vortex spell. Uh, it roams around a decent amount, can get you a lot of value against AI, which clumps. But if you're simply looking for a vortex spell or some AoE damage, you've got much better options. You've got much better lores to turn to than Lore of Death. And unfortunately, it, it doesn't add itself a B tier. Uh, though I think it's still a very much usable lore. Don't get me wrong. I, it's just a bit weaker than one might think. And finally, we do have Lore of Beast, which I'm going to put above Death, actually. Uh, a lot of minor buffs make up this lore. Uh, you've got Pan's Impenetrable Belt as well as Wiston's Wild Form. These buff physical resistance and in the case of uh, Pan's Belt and Impenetrable uh, Wiston's Wild and Pan's Impenetrable Belt and Wiston's Wild Form gets armor and weapon strength. Um, has some good synergy with your non-AP units. Uh, has some good synergy with lightly armored troops for sure. But ultimately you've got better options in other lores. For example, Rule of Life, you have got Shield of Thorns which I think is a better spell than those um you do have something like bronus time warp which is a better buff than uh damage output buffs like wisdom's wild form uh, curse of honorary is a nice aoe debuff you do have a lot of aoe's which is nice for campaign but uh wisdom's wild form or sorry uh, curse of honorary ultimately not that much of a game decider it can help you hold the line a bit better but it's not as good as say a curse of the midnight wind or um a transmutation of lead or something like that uh or even a soul blight you do have the uh transformation of kadon lets you summon a manticore which is cool but once again unit limits can kick in though i'm not sure if that's been rectified for 40 stacks like i said i don't really play with summons in campaign very much so i'm not 100 sure on that but uh, a manticore is not really the biggest game changer in campaign it's like okay i got one more 800 gold unit in this massive battle that's spanning the entire map like who really cares unless you want that cheap terror uh amber spear decent for single targets or single infantry units but it is difficult to line up uh and oftentimes you've got you there's much better ways of punishing ai blobbing uh amber spear works much better in multiplayer where people tend to space their units out and so you need to pick off key targets rather than campaign where AI just blobs like a dummy and you can nuke them with a vortex uh and, and that basically sums the lore up for me. Flock of Doom, I should mention, is a really respectable damage spell. Does direct damage, AoE. But it takes a very long time to whittle your foes down. Once again, a Vortex or Breath spell or Wind spell could do more in most cases. Uh, so that is going to get Beasts itself a B tier. Now that is it for Lores of Magic in Total War Warhammer 2 campaign. Um... As usual, feel free to share your own thoughts, opinions, critiques, and comments down below. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, I try to give all these lures a fair shake. I believe all these lures are absolutely usable. If you have no magic, it's better to have some magic than none. Uh, so even these weaker lures, in my opinion, are good to have if you've got no other option. But I do think that some of the lures in this are just much better suited to dealing with a none-too-bright AI that loves to blob, that tends to bring units that... Uh, you can really punish with large AoEs and tends to play in a manner that really allows you to punish it with large AoEs. And the nature of the battles is also different. The battles are bigger. So 20 on 20 or 40 on 40 battles, the fact that you can hit a large area of combat is much more important than it is in the smaller multiplayer battles. In multiplayer, the biggest you're going to see is 20 on 20. And usually the battles are smaller. You will often see like a 10 on 20 or 10 on 15 or 10 on 10 or whatever, depending on what the factions engaged are and in those situations uh, big aoes are not as vital and not as deciding as they are in campaign and so that is something to keep in mind and uh, hopefully this list here gives you guys some idea of how i'd rank lores and what i prioritize when it comes to their ranking regardless certainly leave your thoughts and opinions down below do hope you guys enjoyed and i will see you all in the next one why right now